Let's bow in prayer. Dear God, you are faith and hope. That is only truly fulfilled in you. Amen. The scripture of the story is taken from Psalms 65, verses 11 to 13. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with riches. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows close themselves with fog. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. <laughs> Scripture is going to be from Matthew 13, 31 to 32. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in the scale. It is the smallest of all the seeds. But when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. This ends the reading. This morning's scripture. Our 
Our topic today is American Atlas. The California of 1920 was very different from today. In 1920, there was about 2.5 million people living in California. Today, it's over 39 million. In Los Angeles, during the same time, L.A. County had a population of just under a million at 900,000. Today, it's over 10 million. Quite a remarkable change. It's hard to imagine what it must have looked like in this area. I remember my mom uh, telling me when she was little, she was born in 1919, that she would go visit her family members in Arcadia, all the way from Pasadena up to Arcadia, probably on a Model T car or something like that. And uh, that's where all the chicken farms were. Arcadia's where the chicken farms were. And here in Alhambra, this is all uh, orange groves and grape vines. One of the other crops that flourished in the area were berries. I remember my parents moved uh, from one house to another house in the Pasadena area when I was, uh, after I graduated from high school. And the first thing my dad did was he went in the backyard and he planted blackberries, and he put trellises up on the fence, and so vines could go up the side of that fence, and he was very successful in growing uh, those berries. When I first started uh, pastoring at a church in High Grove United Methodist out in the Riverside area, it was the heart of where our sun-kissed oranges come from, and right across from the church was the packing plant for Sunkiss, where oranges were sent all over the world. Our theme for this new series of sermons is lessons from the places we love to eat. During the next seven months, we're going to look at some of the restaurants and stores that were birthed in Southern California to see what we can learn. Our passage today is about the mustard seed, the smallest of all the seeds, but grew to a great shrubbery that all the birds uh, came to death. As we will discover, the smallest idea becomes the start of something that is much bigger than we could ever imagine. Now, another childhood memory. After church, there once in a while, my father would ask me and my two older sisters, do you want to take the short route or the long route home? Of course, we always said the long route. And we always ended up at Mott's Berry Farm. And it wasn't to go to the theme park, it was to go to the restaurant. And the dress shop, my dad always bought new dresses for my sisters. Well, I went out and looked at the strange, uh, I think it was like a little devil out in the side yard with uh, smoke coming out. Well, you know, if you remember that, uh, where the ghost town was. But that was one of our favorite films. So rather than being the Disneyland family, we were a not very far. So it's interesting to think about not very far. In 1920, Walter and Cordelia not alive in Lincoln Park. They opened a roadside store to sell their berries. In 1927, they opened up the tea room where they were selling pies and sandwiches. Now, they were growing blackberries at the time. And if you remember, the crop comes up just at certain times of the year. So by turning the berries into jam, but preserve those berries, and they could sell that product all year long. In 1934, they served their first chicken dinner, which became a big hit. And because of the crowds, they built a ghost town, the Main Street, and then later a theme park. So they were a theme park before Disney even started. Of course, it has grown and grown uh, over the years, and become quite an institution throughout 
the California area. Now, one of the things that's interesting is the story of the boysenberry. So, how long back did the boysenberry come along? So, there was this guy by the name of Rudolph Boysen. And uh, he had been experimenting uh, with different uh, grapes. And so, I'm sorry, with different berries. And he had taken blackberries and red raspberries and loken berries and planted them all in the area and did cuttings to eventually he started a brand new berry out of the cuttings of those three different types of berries. But this was during the Depression, and so he had this really lost the field and sort of forgot about it. But one of his friends remembered those berries and told uh, the knots about him and said, you got to meet this guy, uh, Boysen, and see what he has. So he talked about it, but he said he didn't know if any of those plants were still alive. So he went back to the field where he had been growing his berries, and there was none there. And they kept looking all throughout the area, until finally, in a ditch full of weeds, they found one plant was left. And so they took cuttings from that plant. And he put it back in the main field where the knots had their farm. And lo and behold, a year later, they had the brand new fruits. They didn't know what to call it. They thought maybe they called it the knots berry or something like that. Instead, after Boysen, they called it the Boysen Bear. It was introduced to the public at Knott's Berry Farm in the tea room in the form of Boysenberry pie and Boysenberry jam. I hope I'm not making you think you're too hungry right now. <laughs> and that experiment worked out pretty well. There's uh, Boysenberry jam throughout the whole country if you want it from Knott's Berry Farm. Not only at that's very uh, itself. Interesting to see how one man's idea to make a new kind of berry bore great fruit as a result of what he was doing, and how others came along beside him and took care of it. This weekend, we are celebrating the 4th of July. In the Declaration of Independence, we find its most famous thing. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the creator of certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Embedded in this statement is an idea that underlies the whole notion of what we call the United States of America, endowed by the creator with certain unalienable the framers of the Declaration of Independence put forth an idea that was quite radical for its time. The countries of Europe were all ruled by kings and queens, whose legitimacy was based on the belief that they were put there by God. And as a result, all those who lived in their land were to follow them because they were ruling. So in Britain, you were a Protestant, and you were born a Christian. Whether you were baptized or not, you were a Christian, according to their beliefs. Even today, when and if Prince Charles becomes king, not only will he be the king of England, he also will be head of the Church of England. So it's still a tradition for that to happen. But John Wesley, one of the founders of the Methodist movement, back in the 1740s, before the revolution came along, was a proponent of a quite different idea. He said people were not Christians because of the king. They were Christians because they chose for themselves to believe in Jesus. Now Wesley, later on, was firmly against the revolution by the colonists. And during the Revolutionary War, he called back all those Methodist leaders to England. Only one stayed behind, a man by the name 
about Francis Asbury, who spent the war hiding out in Delaware with his friend, but secretly kept in touch with the Methodist Society that were found throughout the colonies. Asbury understood something that Wesley had not quite grasped. If a person becomes a Christian because they choose to believe, what is the role of a king or a queen in their life? The writers of the Declaration of Independence captured this when they said the Creator gave people their rights, not a king or a queen. When the United States won its freedom from England, the Methodists were in a quandary. Because they were an option of the Church of England, uh, John Wesley was a priest in the Church, people did not want to be associated with the Church of England. So, in 1781, the first American-born denomination was formed when the Methodist Episcopal Church was started, with Francis Asbury and Thomas Pope named as the first bishops of this newly formed church. This morning, we're meeting in what room? Asbury Lounge, yeah, named after Francis Asbury, unless there was an Asbury in the church that I didn't know about. <laughs> so it was named after him, and that tradition uh, continues today. One of the key principles of the founding of the United States is the central idea that each of us has the right to choose for ourselves our own religion. Since the founding of our country, churches have had to ask some key questions. What do we believe? What do we need to do to attract people to our church? How does the way we live go to people that our faith is true? Our lesson for today is that ideas can have great consequences. Voices playing around with some berries created a new berry, the Boise berry, which became the signature food of nuts and bread. Wesley and other writers of the time proposed that people need to find faith for themselves. They were not born into it, it was a choice. The notion of choosing God led to the formation of the United States and undergirds the concept of democracies around the world. For if we can choose God, and we can choose the world. We are God. Matthew 13, 31 through 32 again says, He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in this field. It is the smallest of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest of the shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. What about you? What is the simple idea that you have that can have a profound effect on people around you? What word of encouragement can you give that will completely transform a person's view of themselves or their particular circumstances? What action can you do out of love and kindness that will show someone the love that God has for them? These are some of the ways that we can be people of faith. And trust that the simplest things that we will do may have the most profound effect on those. Let us pray. Most gracious God, we give you thanks because you've blessed us with creativity, with ideas, and with a heart for others. Help us to be people who plant seeds that bear great fruit. In the name of Jesus, we pray.